exports and imports. A Japanese team's participation in an international race to the moon is in jeopardy because of a setback related to the launch. And on Pick and Search, there's something in here. Can you guess who this long tail belongs to? We begin in Japan where heavy snow A four-car local train got stuck in the snow at a railway crossing in the city of Sanjo on Thursday evening. More than 400 people were on board. Passengers were left waiting for over half. Passengers were left waiting for over half a day. Some were picked up by their families, but most were waiting it out. One man in his 40s was taken to hospital after complaining of dehydration. Two other women were two other women were treated by first responders. Had to stand. They had to put cardboard on the floor and took turns sitting down. The train began moving again on Friday morning, after snowplows finally cleared a path. By the time passengers got off the train, they were upset. I wish Japan Railways had a better system that could have cleared the snow sooner. The train's lights, heaters and toilets were operational during the wait. Train operators also delivered food and drinks to the passengers. So let's go right away to our meteorologist Sayaka Mori for the details. Um, heavy loads of snow, when will it ease? Well, it looks like snow will ease on Sunday, but until then, we won't see any significant improvement. We will see more snowfall. Some areas uh, have seen about 70 centimeters over the past 24 hours. So heavy snow is pounding many places of Japan, from Hokkaido down towards Kyushu. I want to share more pictures coming out of several spots of the country. Cold air and moisture from the ocean are causing heavy snow in Japan. Over 40 to 80 centimeters snow has fallen over the past 24 hours. Transportation has been severely halted. Heavy snow is expected to last into Saturday, but some areas will continue to see snow into early next week. Now, we are looking at heavy snow for particularly over the Hokuriku region. This is the city of Niigata. Nearly 70 centimeters of snow is on the ground. That's 10 times higher than normal. This is what's happening. Strong cold air is hitting the mountain over North Korea, and the cold stream separate into two, and then it merged over the Sea of Japan, and clouds develop, and the developed snow clouds are hitting the Hokuriku region, including Niigata Prefecture. Now, again, there is 70 centimeters of snow on the ground in Niigata, 65 centimeters in Ishikawa. And in fact, due to heavy snowfall earlier this week or earlier this month, we've got tons of snowfall already across northern Japan, nearly 2.6 meters in the Tohoku region. Now, still an additional 70 centimeters of snow is expected over the Hokuriku region and surrounding areas. That will be combined with thunderstorms. So dangerous weather will likely continue. The coldest year of the season is blanketing many places of Japan. In fact, 90% of the country saw freezing morning today, and due to the cold weather, we saw small hail falling over the southern areas of Japan in Okinawa. Now, we will see cold weather grip in most part of Japan as we go into the next couple of days. Tokyo's morning low could be minus 2 degrees on Saturday. It could be the coldest morning of the season, so do bundle up. And as we go into next week, it's going to be pretty warm, so that may cause flooding and avalanches. And to our next story, a number of countries will meet next week in Vancouver to discuss ways to stop the North Korean threat. A U.S. official says the goal is to tighten pressure on the North leadership. We believe that this pressure campaign remains the best avenue to force change in Kim Jong-un's behavior and to get him to the negotiating table for meaningful discussions. Among the issues we will be discussing is how the international community can thwart North Korean efforts to evade UN sanctions through smuggling. Brian Hook says demonstrating that diplomatic options remain open and viable will be part of that process. 
Hook added the U.S. and North Korea would not hold talks during the Winter Olympics in South Korea next month. The high-level meeting next week will be co-hosted by the United States and Canada. Japan and South Korea's foreign ministers will attend. Hook says China and Russia, two countries critical of U.S. efforts on North Korea, will not be in attendance. Meanwhile, the U.S. Air Force has deployed a trio of nuclear-capable B-2 stealth bombers to Guam. A senior general says the move sends a signal to everyone amid tensions with North Korea. The U.S. Pacific Air Forces announced on Wednesday that 200 personnel along with the three aircraft have been deployed to Anderson Air Force Base. The base is a strategic point in the Asia Pacific. It's already home to a fleet of B-1 bombers that have taken part in joint exercises on the Korean Peninsula. The latest round of planned drills has been delayed ahead of the Winter Olympics in South Korea, where Pyongyang is sending a delegation. It's unclear how long the B-2 bombers will be stationed in Guam. The U.S. territory was singled out by the North last year as a potential target. The U.S. Defense Department says the aircraft deployment is part of an ongoing rotation. Despite a U.S.-led pressure campaign on Pyongyang, North Korea's state-run media is reporting some tough talk from their leader, Kim Jong-un. The ruling Korean Workers' Party newspaper, Rodong Shimun, quotes Kim as saying, the country can overcome all obstacles, even if sanctions by its enemies continue for 100 years. He made the comments during a visit to the State Academy of Sciences. Kim reportedly praised scientists for helping in the development of nuclear and missile programs. The newspaper also described this week's ministerial talks with the South as a turnaround in the inter-Korea relationship that can be attributed to Kim. Meanwhile, Russia's president is showering praise on North Korea's leader, declaring him the winner in a standoff with the West over its nuclear and missile programs. Vladimir Putin made the remarks on Thursday while meeting with top Russian media officials. Kim Jong-un has achieved his strategic aims. He has nuclear warheads and global-range missiles. Beyond doubt, a mature politician. Putin's comments come days after the inter-Korean meeting that paved the way for the North's participation at next month's Winter Olympics in the South. Putin says Kim is cleaning up the situation, smoothing it and calming it. This, of course, comes after the North drew the ire of the international community and a slew of sanctions. Russia has been urging to resolve the issue through dialogue, something Putin reiterated. The U.S. president is also referring to Kim positively in an unusual turn. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal, Donald Trump claims he has a good relationship with Kim Jong-un. When asked if he has ever spoken with him, Trump said he doesn't want to comment on it. In the past, Trump repeatedly referred to Kim as Rocket Man and has insulted his height and weight. Kim has called Trump mentally deranged. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has left for a tour of six countries, including Baltic and Eastern European nations, to discuss various issues, including North Korea. I will call for international cooperation in boosting pressure on North Korea. I will also push for working together on urgent issues the world is facing now. I hope to promote economic ties with the countries I visit. Abe left Tokyo's Haneda Airport on Friday morning for the Baltic nation of Estonia, the first leg of the six-day trip. It will also take him to Latvia and Lithuania, as well as the former Soviet bloc countries of Bulgaria, Serbia and Romania. Uh, approaches to prevent the development of nuclear weapons. A 2015 deal was reached with Iran and six world powers to sharply curb Iran's nuclear program in exchange for lifting economic sanctions. 
The move was welcomed by the international community, who held it up as an example to prevent nuclear proliferation. Trump has called it the worst deal ever. Last October, he vowed to decertify it. And now the U.S. Treasury Secretary says he expects new sanctions are coming. European nations worry Iran could scrap the deal if that happens. Let's go to Yuko Fukushima for the updates in business. So Yuko, China's trade looks to be in good shape. I think that's good for the world economy, including Japan, right? Yes. In 2017, we saw a lot of containers in and out of China. And that's because of a recovery in the global economy. But officials are warning growth may slow down this year. More on that in just a moment. In other news tonight, Japan's tourist boom. There is no sign of this trend slowing down. And in our week ahead, an expert tells us why Asia's economy may lose a little momentum in the year ahead. But first, China's trade boom. Full year results for 2017 show a sharp jump in both imports and exports, thanks to strong demand at home and abroad. Customs officials say exports rose 7.9 percent in dollar terms from 2016. A global economic recovery kept Chinese factories busy. Imports climbed even more, up almost 16 percent. Shipments of natural gas increased as the country worked to replace coal and the clean coal with cleaner energy. The total trade value for the year came to $4.1 trillion. That's up more than 11 percent from the previous year, marking the first increase in three years. But trade growth slowed in December, and officials are warning global demand could start to cool off. Given uncertainties in the international environment, it will be difficult for China to maintain double-digit growth in trade. China's trade surplus with the U.S. widened to $275 billion. That's up 10 percent. The Trump administration has been pressing Beijing to address the trade imbalance. Staying with China trade, a group of farmers in Japan is knocking on the door of one of the world's largest rice markets. And they've chosen online retail giant Alibaba as their point of entry. They've listed their rice... ...affluent consumers looking for appetizing gifts. The Federation has set aside four tons of its premium grain to test the waters in China. If that goes down well, it will consider increasing varieties and volume. Tourists are coming to Japan in ever greater numbers. Officials report the figure for 2017 was a record high for the fifth straight year. The tourism ministry counted almost 28.7 million foreign arrivals last year, up nearly 20 percent from 2016. Low-cost carriers are operating more flights. That's one reason. Cruise ships are also making Japan a regular port of call. Initially, most tourists came in large groups and focused on shopping, but that seems to be changing. We are facing challenges. There are more individual travelers and more people seeking the Japanese experience. The government hopes to see the number of visitors reach 40 million in 2020. Singapore is working on a driver-free upgrade to its public transport system. It's an international project, and Volvo of Sweden is already on board. The Swedish automaker is joining hands with a national university in Singapore, among others. The team will develop a 12-meter-long autonomous bus. The battery-powered vehicle will seat 40 passengers. They hope to start road tests on the island state next year. Singapore's government wants to introduce self-driving buses from 2022. Volvo says it's considering taking part in a bid for the project. And now to the markets. In Tokyo, the Nikkei slipped about a quarter of percent to end the week at 23,653. A strong yen and profit-taking drove the index down. Investors also sold after the Economic Watchers survey showed a slip from the month before. The survey rates business sentiment polling taxi drivers, clerks, and other frontline workers sensitive to economic trends. Over in China, the Shanghai Composite continued rising to 3,428. This was despite the import data for December coming in much lower than traders had expected. 
The Hand Sign remains the star performer, though, uh, extending its winning streak to 14 straight sessions. Strong gains on Wall Street overnight, and the IT sector pulled the benchmark higher. And to the rest of the region, straight times in Singapore rose about two-tenths of a percent after November retail sales surged to the highest in almost two years. And in Australia, the index there edged slightly higher. Miners soared on rising, rising iron ore prices, offsetting sell-off in banking shares. Now let's take a look at what's happening in the week ahead. On Wednesday, Japan's machinery orders for November come out. This leading indicator of capital investment rebounded in October after falling the previous month. Later in the day, we'll get the latest snapshot of the U.S. economy as the Federal Reserve releases its base rate. Central bankers in South Korea meet on Thursday to decide monetary policy. In the November meeting, they uh, raised in key interest rates for the first time in more than six years. On the same day, China releases a batch of indicators. Officials are expected to announce the country's GDP for the October to December period. We're also waiting for industrial production and retail sales for December. The Asia-Pacific region has been a powerhouse for the global economy for decades. But many are wondering if this steady path will continue ahead in 2018. The Asian Development Bank has revised down slightly its outlook on the Asian economy for 2018. It predicts 5.8 percent growth compared to an estimated 6 percent last year. China is expected to slow down, while Southeast Asia's growth rate is forecast to hold steady. ADP's chief economist Yasuyuki Sada spoke to NHK about the growth downgrade, starting with the situation in China. Chinese economy is now, now on re rebalancing phase of its economy from uh, export driven and manufacturing driven to the um, uh, domestic uh, uh, consumption led as well as a service sector driven economy. As to the cyclical factors, China has been on its uh, adjustment phase of excess capacity uh, issue of uh, uh, heavy industrial sectors uh, such as uh, coal, uh, steel and petrochemical uh, sectors. So naturally uh, investment uh, uh, rate of China uh, growth will uh, decline over time. High level, high debt levels seen in some countries in the region could also pose risks. We saw uh, some countries, uh, uh, corporate sector and the household sectors, indebtedness has been accumulating. For example, China corporate sector, overall corporate sector to GDP ratio is as high as 166 percent. Korea household uh, overall debt to GDP. says the ADB can do more to help them. Infrastructure investment, huge uh, needs exist in Asia. Uh, according to our study, 1.7 trillion US dollars per year investment needed. So ADB will play a very important role, critical role, to fill in this investment gap so that the Asian economy can uh, continue growth momentum, poverty reduction trend, help uh, achieve a global uh, climate uh, A Japanese team in a contest to send a robotic spacecraft to the moon may be forced to abort the mission due to problems involving the launch. The aim of the Google Lunar X Prize is to land the first private sector unmanned spacecraft on the moon. $20 million will go to the first team whose craft will travel 500 meters over the lunar surface and transmit video and data back to Earth. Team Hakuto brings together a group of space professionals and a venture company. It's competing against four other teams from the United States, Israel, India, and a multinational squad. All of them have until March 31st to launch their missions. Team Hakuto had secured a slot on the same rocket used by its Indian rival. Bad news came from the Indian side. Team Hakuto has been informed the rocket launch is now unlikely due to a breakdown of talks with the Indian Space Agency. But the team says it's not about to throw in the towel just yet. 
We've faced all kinds of difficulties in the past. We will deal with the current challenge step by step. We're not giving up, so we'll keep fighting to accomplish the mission. The deadline for the launch has been extended several times so far. Meanwhile, India's space agency is celebrating the launch of a rocket that carried 31 satellites into orbit. Most of the satellites are from the U.S., the U.K., and other foreign countries. Pachari Raksamwang has the details. Pachari? India's space industry has been growing rapidly. Friday's successful launch only made the country more confident. Two, one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus the rocket was launched from the space center in Sriharikota, southern India. It released satellites one by one into orbit, up to an altitude of 500 kilometers. India is known for providing other countries with satellite launches at low costs and a high success rate. But in August, a string of 39 successful launches was broken with a failure. The head of the space agency says progress has been made. about the military's admission that security forces killed 10 Rohingya in their custody. She says that it is a step toward establishing the rule of law in the country. Aung San Suu Kyi also says the military is trying to fulfill its responsibility to do that. While Rohingya have been saying many innocent Muslims were killed in northern Rakhine state, the leader repeatedly said there had been no wrongdoing that resulted in criticism from the international community. At a press conference in Naypyidaw with Japan's foreign minister on Friday, she said her country is facing both constructive and unconstructive criticism. She added that only the people of Myanmar can decide what they will do. The United Nations estimates that more than 650,000 Rohingya have fled to neighboring Bangladesh since Myanmar's military began a clearance operation in August. The UN has described the situation as ethnic cleansing, an accusation Myanmar denies. An Iranian oil tanker that collided with a Chinese freighter and caught fire is now drifting in Japan's exclusive economic zone in the East China Sea. Japan's Coast Guard has dispatched ships and aircraft to monitor the situation. China state-run media reports that the vessel is carrying about 140,000 tons of petroleum products and continues to burn. Chinese maritime authorities have deployed 12 ships to try to put out the blaze and search for 32 crew members listed as missing. But toxic gas is reportedly hampering their efforts. There is also a risk that the tanker will explode and sink. In Malaysia, people of Chinese descent account for about a quarter of the population, with China seeking a stronger economic foothold overseas through its Belt and Road Initiative. This community is looking to benefit. NHK World's Koji Yamamoto has more. Today's trend is about Belt and Road Initiative. This symposium attracted officials from small and mid-sized businesses in Malaysia. The organizer was the Malaysia Chinese Association Bell and Road Center, which is financially supported by the Chinese government. Shipping costs by using China's planned sea route. But not every company is behind China's initiative. One landscaping firm struck a deal with a Chinese real estate developer three years ago to construct high-end condominiums. Then about a year ago, the Chinese government limited the amount Chinese firms can invest in overseas projects. The condo project had to be suspended 
resulting in a loss of over $600,000. So when something happens in China, it also affects us here. A lot of businesses are politically aligned and that's fine. I'm okay with that, that's their choice. But for me, I do not wish to be in that group. China's rapid advance into overseas markets is creating a lot of momentum and the impact is starting to be felt by the overseas Chinese community in Malaysia. Koji Yamamoto, NHK World, Kuala Lumpur. And that wraps up our bulletin. I'm Pachiri Raksa Wong in Bangkok. Japanese government officials are protesting to their counterparts in China because they say a Chinese submarine traveled through waters near the Senkaku Islands. Officials say this is the first time a foreign submarine has come so close to territorial waters near the islands. NHK World's Tomoko Kurabayashi explains the significance. Japan controls the islands. The Japanese government maintains the islands are an inherent part of Japan's territory. China and Taiwan claimed them. Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force officials spotted a surf in the island's contiguous zone, an area just outside of territorial waters. But that is too close for comfort for Japan, which is letting China know that it is not happy about the move. A former vice admiral with the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force explains what might be behind the move. This is a very sensitive area. Showing off at a time when the relationship between Japan and China is changing. China also wants to see how the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force reacts to this incident, or what influence this The incident comes at a time when Japan and China's leaders are hoping to improve relations. Shinzo Abe and Xi Jinping were making progress. Canada says he believes this might have been a rogue move by the Chinese military. Xi's administration is in the midst of a corruption crackdown. The military has to comply. But I think people are disgruntled. I believe that the political message Xi's administration is sending has not reached everyone in the Chinese military. If that is the case, the military has acted on its own. Japanese government officials say it's not clear what's behind China's latest move and say they hope this incident does not have a larger political impact. Tomoko Kurabayashi, NHK World, Tokyo. A quick correction to make. Earlier, we incorrectly referred to Serbia as a former Soviet bloc country. We apologize for the error. A Japanese woman is helping to break tradition and taking on a craft that was once considered a man's job. Hidashunke is a type of lacquerware that has a storied past in the country. NHK World's Kazuhiro Takazaki reports on a new twist on an old culture. Forty-one-year-old Elena Horiuchi was the first person to take up Hidashunke for three decades and the first woman apprentice ever. I truly enjoy my work and know I made the right decision to apprentice here. Horiuchi majored in architecture at university and then worked as a translator after graduating. She came across Hidashunke during a visit to Takayama in 2010. She was fascinated by the craft and immediately decided to work there. Hida Shunke involves two separate stages 
first making the wooden base and then applying the lacquer. The latter is more glamorous work. However, Horiuchi chose a former path without hesitation. If the surface of the wood isn't smooth enough, they will not be able to apply the lacquer well. Compared to the lacquer ware made in other areas, we put a greater emphasis on creating a beautiful wooden base. Horiuchi's master, Kenichi Kawakami, has worked as an artisan for half a century. He is 67 now and knows how hard it is to make a living from Hida Shunke. He agreed to teach Horiuchi, but only after she developed woodworking skills at a local furniture company. Kawakami finally accepted her as an apprentice just over a year ago. She came to me and said she would dedicate the rest of her life to the craft because she was captivated by the wooden bases used in Hirashunke. Of course, she has to strengthen her arms and her grip. They're essential for doing this work. One aspect of the craft that surprised Horiuchi was that artisans make their own wood carving tools. They have to be shaped by hand. Each artisan needs more than 10 tools. Because Kawakami has greater muscle strength, his tools are larger. Horiuchis are more delicate with thinner braids. This makes them better suited to more intricate carving. It's amazing that they're all handmade. It's all so fascinating. <laughs> She concentrates on making items that can be used on a daily basis, making them as beautiful as she can. Teacups are especially challenging because it's hard to carve out the inside. Horiuchi's works are starting to become popular thanks to their elegant shapes. Her sole aim is to create items that she can feel proud of. I want my work to be based on your traditional craft, but I also want to adapt it and develop my own style. It would be good if you can allow your female side to come through and be reflected in your work. Recently, another woman has followed Horuchi by apprenticing with a craftsperson specializing in the raka work. These women are breathing new life into an old tradition and keeping the beauty of Hidashunke alive for future generations. Kazuhiro Takazaki, NHK World, Takayama. Hokuriku a dragon-shaped region facing the Sea of Japan, known as Snow Country. And Hida, nestled high in the mountains, known for its forests. In these regions, ancient culture and craftsmanship serve as a foundation of modern industry. Explore Hokuriku and Hida, only on NHK World. Today's Pick and Search looks at a charming creature that hails from Kochi Prefecture in western Japan. And his charm point is measured by its length.
of course means lesser birds, but there are people still trying to bring them back and preserve the look, like, what's this? These little guys. Wow, they're so cute. <laughs> um, okay, second thoughts about the pet thing. Maybe you should get one, Aki. Well, you know, I live with a pack of dogs, so I don't think it's a good idea, if you know what I mean. Okay, <laughs> all right. Saika Mori joins us again for more on the world weather. So Saika, earlier you told us about the serious conditions here in Japan. What about in other parts of East Asia? Yes, unlike most parts of Japan, it's mostly dry across China as well as the Korean Peninsula, but frigid air is gripping many places. We are looking at quite low temperatures, especially in the morning hours. Now, the capital of South Korea had minus 15 degrees Celsius this morning, and parts of northern China had the morning low of minus 40 degrees or so. So shivering cold weather is gripping many parts of the country, but again, thanks to a couple of high-pressure systems, it's freezing mark and then even warming up to six degrees on Monday. That's warmer than the average for this time of year. And Pyongyang minus three up to two degrees on Sunday. And as we reported earlier, Tokyo's high will be in the double digits as we go into next week. Now, in the south, there is a tropical disturbance near the Malay Peninsula. Uh, this system is a very slow-moving system. We will see heavy rainfall at least into early next week. Uh, some areas like Singapore and Malaysia may see up to 500 millimeters rain, especially in the mountainous locations that may cause landslides. Now, across North America, uh, earlier this week, significant floods and also mudslides took place in Los Angeles, killing at least 17 people and still more than 40 people are missing. The same system is now affecting the eastern United States and eastern Canada with freezing precipitation. We are talking about freezing rainfall heavy snowfall and also icy precipitation. Now back behind it, as you can see, the pressure gradient is pretty tight. So very cold northerly winds are moving in. So that is pushing down temperatures quite significantly. And many areas will see significant snowfall as well. Now we will see quite low temperatures once again in Canada, minus 22 degrees for the high on Friday. With strong winds, you could feel much colder than this actual number. And then cold air is now dripping uh, it's now shifting towards the south, approaching the northern areas of the United States, minus three degrees in Chicago. But as opposed to that, thanks to the nice southerly winds, temperatures are pretty good across the eastern United States. It's more like spring in Washington, D.C., but it'll come to an end soon. Now, within the next couple of days, the high will be only minus two degrees in Washington, D.C. on Sunday. So watch out for the significant change in temperatures. All right, that's it from me. Have a nice weekend. Japanese soccer legend Kazuyoshi Miura has broken his own record for the oldest player to sign a contract in the country's professional league. The star striker will turn 51 next month. He said he's happy to be staying in the game and aims to play his best. Miura has been a familiar sight to fans ever since the J-League started in 1993. 
he broke another of his own records last year when he became the league's oldest goal scorer. Miura plans to join his team, Yokohama FC, in Vietnam next week as they prepare for the start of the season in February. And once again, the headlines. Snow is buffeting northeastern Japan and a passenger train was left stranded overnight. A number of countries are preparing to meet next week to strengthen pressure on North Korea. But Kim Jong-un says his country can withstand any sanctions. China has posted its trade results for 2017. They show a sharp jump in both exports and imports. A Japanese team's participation in an international race to the moon is in jeopardy because of a setback related to the launch. And if you missed any of our stories, please visit our NRT website. And that's it for today's Newsroom Tokyo. I'm Hideki Nakayama. And I'm Aki Shibuya. Coming up next, NHK World's interview program, Direct Talk. Stay with us. Welcome to NHK World Direct Talk. Maria Tri Silistiani is a children's book author.